Hi, I'm James Taylor, business creativity and innovation keynote speaker, and this is The Creative Life, a show dedicated to you, the creative. If you're looking for motivation, inspiration, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's an author, musician, entrepreneur, performer, designer, or thought leader. They'll share with you their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, and much, much more. You'll find show notes for this episode, as well as free training on creativity, over at jamestaylor.me. Enjoy this episode. Hi, it's James Taylor here. Today's episode was first aired as part of International Authors Summit. This inspiring virtual summit reveals the secrets of making, marketing, and monetizing a best-selling book. If you would like to access the full video version as well as in-depth sessions with over 40 best-selling authors, then I've got a very special offer for you. Just go to internationalauthorssummit.com where you'll be able to register for a free pass for the summit. Yeah, that's right. Over 40 New York Times and Amazon best-selling authors, book editors, agents, and publishers sharing their insights, strategies, and tactics on how to write and market your first or next bestseller. So just go to internationalauthorssummit.com, but not before you listen to today's episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Joanna Penn. Joanna Penn is a speaker, entrepreneur, and award-nominated New York Times and USA Today bestselling author. Since becoming a writer, she has authored 27 books and sold over 500,000 copies in 84 countries and five languages. She writes thrillers under the name of J.F. Penn and uses a full Joanna Penn name to write nonfiction for authors. When not sitting at a desk crafting her next work, you'll find her on stage speaking about self-publishing and book marketing. Her site, thecreativepen.com, is regularly voted one of the top 10 sites for both aspiring and professional writers. And it's my great pleasure to have Joanna with us today. So welcome, Joanna. Oh, thanks for having me, James. It's good to talk to you. So what's happening in your world just now? What are you currently working on? Oh, it's a great day to talk to me because just this morning, I actually delivered my next thriller, um, which is called Valley of Dry Bones, to my editor. So Yay! I'm actually in a really, I'm in a really <laughs> good mood today. Um, it's, a, it's one of those moments, like as in I've just finished the first edit. So the book is like, if I published it right now, it would be fine, but it's about 95%. I think. So um, yeah, one of those good days when I probably have a gin and tonic after this, actually, <laughs> a bit of a celebration. Cause, cause I, 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 when different authors, I, I know that they can they have little gifts to themselves, little things that just to mark those different occasions in your know, first draft and other things. So is a gin and tonic, is that is that your your reward of choice then when you kind of get to the stage in the process? Well, to be honest, it's, it's my reward of choice or my drowning my sorrows of choice. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I think I think the big the big deal is with when when I finish this draft, when I send it to my editor, that's when I set up my pre-order. So this is a kind of a, a bit of a tip for when you know the timelines. When you're um, an independent author, you need to know the timelines of when you can publish stuff. And once I've got this draft, I know pretty much the dates I can send to my proofreaders, my beta readers, and put, you know I can put up my. I know when I can get this book out now. So I'm. I, that's why this is such an important milestone. I think. Now this is a, a fiction book. This one you've just worked on but you've also you write non-fiction as well do the do the timelines dif- differ from this stage you know when you have that that version of the book is it different depending on whether you're writing fiction or non-fiction it depends very much and I know we, we might come on to series in general but this is book 10 in an established series my arcane thrillers which are kind of Laura Croft meets Dan Brown um so I know the characters I know the world I know the structure I just need the plot this has actually taken about 18 months of thinking but it only took six weeks of writing. Mm. Um, my last nonfiction book, which was How to Write Nonfiction, which was quite meta, was actually a longer book. It took about three three months, three to four months, and it was um, it's you know it's a standalone. Although I've got books for authors, and I think that one was much was kind of much more difficult because it had so much to go into it. So what I would say to people is, th- I don't think there is necessarily a guaranteed timeline for any book Uh, I do think you have to set deadlines for yourself so this is a really important productivity tip I mean I know you know this um, but when you're if you know that I can't remember the law it is but the project will expand to the time that you you give it I think that one 
<laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. If you say, oh, I've got forever to write my book, it doesn't matter, then it will take you forever. And there are authors, you know, who spend years and years writing. Whereas I tend to set a timeline, a deadline for it, aim for that. And even if you miss it, you still tend to get close enough to that. Um, so I find that really important. And again, especially as an independent running my own business, I have to set my own timelines. And of course, um, readers always want the book like the next day. <laughs> so you have to kind of balance productivity with mental health, which can be a difficult thing. But that, that's an important point, you know, that mental health, that, you know, the being a healthy author, because you, you're, you're speaking all the time with lots of different types of authors. Of the ones that you found that are both productive and sane at the same time, and they have a kind of healthy attitude to their, to their work, and they're, they're just nice people to, they're good people to be around. Uh, have you noticed anything in common? with them or is, is there anything in terms of the person you think personalities or you mentioned kind of giving yourself little rewards what, what what's what what um, signifies someone you think is that is both a, someone is a really good author but they also they have a quite a healthy attitude to writing well actually last year I co-wrote a book uh, with a medical doctor called the healthy writer so this is something that's very dear to my heart and what we actually found and you know it's one of those things with health you think it's rocket science and then it's not um is getting a lot of sleep so it's really funny I'm very productive I've written 28 books I, I write a lot I do a lot and I sleep for eight to nine hours per night I'm like a sleep a sleep machine uh, because my conscious brain really needs sleep I read a lot so I, I normally go to bed quite early and I'll read for an hour to be better. Um, and then physical movement is critical for writers so I'm standing up right now I think you are as well right are you at a standing desk actually I'm sitting at my sitting desk but I, I just I invested in a very very nice chair recently it's a uh, um, I can't remember the name the make of it but it's like uh, it's a very very nice chair it's the one that I, I was told to get for ergonomics and all that stuff but but I know you you're you're standing because you, you prefer doing a lot of the standing thing yes yeah, so I, I have a standing desk for things like podcasting and then I have various accoutrements for working in cafes I, I mean I get it all out for the cafe as well <laughs> so that everything's at the right height but definitely I think people people think that writing is simple uh, you know, uh, you just sit down and write stuff. Um, but it's very tiring. And I think that this is because, you know, they say we have a certain amount of willpower a day or a certain, you have a certain amount of capacity per day. And when you are making decisions, whether it's making decisions for your characters, whether it's what chapter to write, how to kind of download your brain for nonfiction, you're making so many choices with what you're writing, even down to word choice. That's actually very tiring. So what I would say to people is don't underestimate the stamina you need to write a book is very different to writing a blog post very different to um, you know writing anything much shorter or something you're used to um, you know you really do need to set aside the time but also the time for your unconscious subconscious so that exercise and sleeping and um, you know looking after your physical and mental health uh, taking a break and like don't fall into internet negativity which can really set you back um don't compare yourself with other people that can be really tough too but you know setting those uh, regular guidelines, those routines. There's a lot of books now on habit formation, routine formation. And I've, I've found that I really, really need my routine in order to write. I have a, a table at a cafe. I have the stuff that I set up my desk with. I drink the same coffee. I go to the yoga class at the same time. I, you know, I, write, I do my dictation at a certain room in a co-working space. And that's how I get my books done and that's not the glamorous stuff right no one wants to hear that but I intersperse that non-glamorous stuff with my research trips which is why I travel a lot as well so yeah th those like I, I sometimes think that in terms of twitter and and posting things and and I thought I, I, would, I would probably have the very the most boring twitter thing if, if I actually posted the, the, the tweets of actually the stuff I do for most of my day as opposed to the the fun stuff where you're traveling and you're speaking and stuff like that it would basically consist of making cups of tea sitting for periods <laughs> walking, going around the room, trying not to go to the fridge to, to have that, that cookie or whatever. So it's all those things that you do. How is your, your process as you become a more experienced writer, obviously you become a very successful writer as well, that, that those habits, those routines, how have those changed? Because you didn't go from like day zero of saying, I'm quitting my job and I'm going to be a full-time author. There, there, was a, there was a bit of a ramp up to how you did that. So I'm interested, 
how did you you kind of ramp that up slowly when you know writing wasn't the thing you the only thing you were doing every day well i think the main thing um and we know this as entrepreneurs as well there's a lot of skills you have to learn around everything so at the same time as um i mean even learning to write fiction versus non-fiction is a quite different skills in themselves but then at the same time you're probably learning how to blog or how to podcast or um how to do speaking or how to how to go into networking things or entering competitions and so i first started writing non-fiction and 2006. Um, so 12 years ago, as we're talking now. So that's when I decided to write my first book, a self-help book, which became Career Change. And it took me five years um, of writing uh, to go full time. And in that time, I'd written a couple of books and started the blog and the podcast. But what the, the main difference, I think, to who I am now is that back then, I, I really didn't ever expect to make a full-time living with my writing. I was primarily a speaker, um, looking to make money from blogging uh, primarily, and now, and, and so a lot of my time was much more around that more uh, regular online stuff. Whereas with books, you kind of have to take a step back and think about intellectual property creation, which might not earn you money right now, but will earn you money over the long term. So I know that my mindset has completely shifted to the idea of creating assets, which will bring me income for the long term. And this is a very powerful concept. And it is why everybody listening that publishing companies want your book because they want assets on their balance sheet. And that will make them income on their profit and loss statement. So this is the thing when you run your own business and you start thinking about creating assets that earn you money for the long term, every hour I put into creating assets will make me money for my lifetime and 70 years after I die, as long as I manage my intellectual property assets well. Um, so that's a big shift. The other thing that shifted is, of course, when I started writing my first novel, I, w I had a day job. I didn't have to pay the bills <laughs> with my writing. So that first novel took me, what, 14 months to write. Um, uh, it, was, it was a hobby, as in I didn't expect necessarily to make money from it. I wanted to, but um, I didn't expect to. I didn't have an audience, and that is both a pro and a con. Um, but now, with book 10 in that same series, as this is, the, you know, book one, Stone of Fire, this is book 10 of that series. Um, I have a, I have an audience who want that book. And then I know the day after that book comes out, they will say, where's the next book? So it's, it's like, great, people are going to buy it. And then, oh my goodness, they're going to want another one so far. So there's lots of pros and cons with how things have changed. And what I would say to people listening what you need to do is make sure that you don't wish your time away and wish that you were at another point in the journey. I know how difficult that is because I think I do too. I mean, I often, I'm always looking forward to the next goal, but make the most of not having an audience to really test ideas, play around with stuff because very soon you will have one and you'll have to deliver to what they want as well as what your creative yeah. self wants. And I'm also, I'm a little bit cautious now. Um, and this is more, more from also the speaking where I, I, I gave a speech recently and, and someone about two weeks later, a publisher actually sent me the front cover of the book of my speech. So I like with my name, they basically mocked up the front cover. This, this publisher had been in the audience and he'd seen my speech and he basically, basically pitched me to, he said, I want to publish the book of this. Now I'll, I'll bring in a ghostwriter. I'll bring in a, I'll co we'll co-write it with you. And it actually made me, it was very nice to have that, but it also made me think I have to be a little bit more conscious of not kind of giving things away as I'm going to going through the process of, right. Obviously you can kind of constantly testing, but there's certain things about, I'm a little bit more cautious now about saying and putting out into the into the world. So I wonder, like, as you're writing, because you write obviously fiction, but you're also, you know, very well versed in, in nonfiction as well, and you publish a lot of nonfiction books. How do you balance that? You know, you must have all these little ideas kind of going around all the time. Think, oh, this is going to be a great. You know, how do you balance that? Like testing it into the market with not giving away too much so when the book comes out it's it's going to be there for folks. Well, with nonfiction, I would say give everything away app just give it all away um what is amazing i like some people turn their blog into a book or their talks into a book i often will write a book and then i turn my book into um 
articles. So a lot of the chapters of my nonfiction books are now articles, they're videos on YouTube, um, they're talks. Uh, but what's so interesting, and again, you know, I think everyone realizes this, uh, people want things packaged in an easy way. So for example, I'm a podcaster, but I also have audio books of all my non, or no, most of my nonfiction and my fiction. So People who listen to audio, you know, we're so busy. So they, someone might find a blog post of mine from, you know, my book, How to Write Nonfiction, but they're not going to sit there and read the like all the blog posts on the blog because that's just not a handy way of doing it. Instead, they might click the link to buy the book and also the audio book um, or the print book or the workbook um, because they're like, oh, that's a really useful chapter. So what I would say with nonfiction is very, very different with fiction, but with nonfiction, um, I don't think it, you know, give it away and then turn that same material into multiple products and multiple streams of income. I really believe that. Very different with yourself, like if you were looking to work with a publisher, remember that if you sign any contract and it goes to every Everyone listening if you sign a contract you really need to be clear what that contract includes for example your publisher might not let you publish that as a blog post they might not let you do an audiobook they might keep those rights they might not let you publish in America or you know Australia so the important thing is to me it's about control and the ability to be global, um, digital, mobile, to take advantage of anything I can, which means I keep control. But for example, I just signed a deal um, yesterday uh, for Korean rights for one of my nonfiction books. So that book's gonna go out in print in Korean. Um, I was never gonna self-publish in Korean. <laughs> so, you know, these are things that can come up uh, either way. So I'm not saying don't sign a contract. I'm saying be very aware of what a contract contains and make sure that it still allows you to do the things you want to do with your own material and intellectual property. So I was saying that, you, that this kind of brings us this idea of obviously traditionally published, uh, we hear like they often traditionally published and uh, let's say self-published or independently published and then you kind of have this kind of hybrid type of thing that kind of goes on as well. Um, I, I first of all, explain explain to me and to the audience like the difference between we hear the self publishing and independent publishing. What is it? What's the, the difference between those things? And who is you know if it's almost to go down that channel, the channel, the route that you've gone, who do you think that is right for? And who do you think would actually be better going for maybe the more traditional way of publishing? Yeah. So um, first of all, I would say the a really important question is what is your definition of success? Really important. Um, and most people don't know what their definition of success is. They think they do, but then if you actually ask them, they're like, oh, I just want to sell some books. And it's like, yeah, that's not that's not good enough. Um, so let's just talk the, the difference between, to me, I don't like saying self-publishing. I don't self-publish. I work with um, professional designers, editors, a number of different editors, proofreaders, beta readers, uh, you know, uh, book designers, printers, you know, so I work with a lot of uh, freelance professionals, many of whom work with traditional publishing. So, and I run, I have my own uh, small press uh, called Curl Up Press. I work with the um, uh, publishers like Ingram Spark, who do printing for the biggest publishing houses in the world. Uh, so these, this is why I call myself an independent author. Um, and some people would say independent publisher, but independent publishers often publish other people's work. I'm an independent author. I only publish my own work or those I, I um, co-write with. Mm. Uh, so, and I have no desire to publish other people just before anyone pitches me. <laughs> um, but then, so the difference with that, and then with traditional publishing, obviously what you're doing is instead of doing it yourself, you're gonna work with a publishing company with an editor, with a designer, and they have the control. And you're gonna sign a contract with them. And uh, the amount of control that you get and input into the process will totally depend on your contract. But just on a purely financial level, most publishing contracts are around 10 to 25% royalties. Some digital first might go up to 50 percent but most of them are the lower ends and uh, as an independent author I get 70 
percent, seven zero percent when I publish direct with Amazon and with my print books, I will do maybe two dollars a book um, profit. So uh, and if people were traditionally published, they'll know they get, normally get a lot less than that. So there's a there's a different financial um, side. The control side is very different. Many traditionally published authors might not get control. It's nice that you got that cover, for example. Um, mo- many authors would not see a cover until much later. Um, what I would say in terms of who it suits, if you are someone who runs your own business, <laughs> you might f- struggle um, with working with a publisher who wants too much control because you're used to everything being in your control, unless you really just want to hand off the whole process to someone else and you're not doing it for the money. So this is a really big deal about this coming back to definition of success. If you want to win a literary prize, then get a traditional publisher. If you want to be a speaker and make money at the back of the room, then you have two options. One, get a traditional publishing deal, make no money, but get bigger speaking gigs, or self-publish and make big bucks at the back of the room. Mm. So this is the thing, you've got so many choices now, and this is what I love about the new model. You have the choice and you can mix and match. So you might decide to do one book with traditional publishing where you get less money, but kudos and then you might self-publish a book at the same time and and then use that for marketing so you make the money on that one and the other ones for kudos so it it totally depends on what you want to achieve but it sounds like for you you know the that sense of being independent having that 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 sense of control obviously there's a there's a big financial difference between those two different ways of doing doing things but it's really the 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 sense of independence the sense of control that being being an independently published you know in, independent author that that's a big thing for you yeah and the other thing i would say is speed um you know if you sign a, a pub, if you get an agent right now it might take a year to get a deal uh once you get a deal it might be another year before the book comes out so book deals take a long 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 time and i don't have that patience i like when i fin- like i've handed that book to the editor today as we talk in the beginning of september i know that book will be published within a month and i know that because i can control the rest of the process whereas again if I was traditionally published it would probably be a year to 18 months by which time I will have written like three or four more books (laughs) so yeah so this is the thing for me the speed is a big aspect the control also the world is changing every day like there are more exciting opportunities every day I've just recently last week got my books into China through Publish Drive um I've now got audiobooks on Google Play uh, you know, we have new opportunities at Walmart with Kobo. My books were in the opening of the Walmart ebook store in the US. These are things that um, come up all the time that, you know, you just don't even know it's going to happen. So if you don't have control, you can't take advantage of this. I also have control of pricing so I can do promotions. Uh, so, yeah, I think at this point, I mean, I would I would absolutely take a deal where, if it fitted what I wanted. But um, I also went into this in order to make good money. I am a businesswoman as well as a creative. And my goal was always to make six figures, then multi six figure income. And I know the way to do this as an independent and the route is clear. I know you've interviewed like Joseph Alexander and some other independent authors who, there is a clear route to making six plus seven figures money in this game now. Whereas traditional publishing feels a lot more like a lottery ticket approach. Whereas you might, you know, you might luck out but yeah. it's not a business plan. And we we interviewed I interviewed Joseph uh, Alexander as well, and it, it was it, it was very complimentary to to you because I said I mean if anyone looking for advice on how to kind of do what what he did, which is kind of going into a, from six to seven speaker author, and he said just read Joanna Penn's books. That that was it. That was his, his cue. And he said he said really I just followed those you know the books that, that Joanna I just looked at in terms of writing and then publishing and I know you do things you know in, in other areas as well in terms of how to build this, the writing business and I think he said now being being Joseph he did like 14 books in the first year as a non-fiction writer so he really wrapped up and now he's obviously working with a lot of co-writers as well and creating almost like a, like a really bigger publishing business as well but as, as he said and as you're saying there there is a route if you want to go down this independent way of doing things and you said you get that independence you get that, that sense of control there's a sense of speed and I know that a lot of people probably watching, listen to this, are professional speakers or aspiring to professional speakers. One of the things that I'd never thought of, someone I interviewed recently, Phil M. Jones, who's a British speaker, lives in New York now. He said one of the things that he wanted to do in independently uh, publishing 
was when he's working with a client now, he can have 500 copies made with that client's you know, logo inside with maybe a forward by the, the CEO of the company. The, he can give out X numbers of books because he knows that those books will bring him in speaking engagements, which will far, you know, give a massive ROI on what he's doing. And he said if he'd been with a traditional author, he just wouldn't have had that flexibility. He just couldn't have done that as well. So I know it's a complicated issue, but uh, I, I think, you know, the, if you are going the, the, this, that, the independently published route, then your books are, I know people have kind of read your books and they've kind of gone through that. And it's, it's a great way of, of thinking about it. Yeah. What I would just add on that is Ingram Spark, who are one of the publishers that many of us use, including big publishing, have just introduced, um, it's only a dollar to personalize a print run. So you can do that one page or whatever at the front of books for whichever client you're in. And it's only going to cost you an extra dollar. Plus you get bulk discounts if you oh. order lots of books. So once you know these things, the pu- seriously, the publishing bit is this much of the process the writing is this much the marketing is that much you know I mean you know marketing any kind of business is that much the publishing is mini the publishing takes me like a couple of hours <laughs> now you're really skilled obviously on on the marketing uh, the marketing side and a lot of people kind of come to you to get ideas and your the creative pen has some great ideas in terms of around mark, marketing but you know for, for a lot of authors or aspiring authors they're still at that stage where where someone like um, Stephen Pressfield would say they have that resistance. Just that process of getting and sitting down every day and if it, and writing those 500 words or their 1,000 words. In, in, in your journey as, a, as an author, what have you learned to help with that? The, 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 the mindset, just the... The, the, the ritual of being able to to write every day to get that to get those words happening well I think like a bit of tough love people like how much do you want this like seriously that's what it comes back to and I think it comes back to it whether you're a speaker whether you're building your small business if you want to write fiction whatever you want how much do you want it and when I I had, you know, the sort of early 30s, what shall I do with my life? And I wrote down what I wanted my life to look like. And it was, I want to read. I love to read. I want to travel and I want to write. And the other thing is that I was so miserable with my job because I just felt like I was on, uh, you know, the rat race and had nothing to show for it. And what I love about writing a book is that you can hold it in your hand and say, I made this. And at the end of the year, you can stack up your books and go, I made these. Like, I've got some behind me here. I made those. They came from my brain. And it's like, wow, I have achieved something. And it just feel it's so tangible. So now I measure my life by what I create. And that to me keeps me going. I mean, like I said, I just finished that book, what I did to, uh, uh, between finishing it at lunchtime. Uh, I cleared my desk. I've stuck my map on the wall because I'm starting my next book because I'm addicted to this process. <laughs> so I'm like, I need to get on with the next book now because I love doing it. So what I would say to people is like, if you're not driven by wanting to achieve being a writer and it's got to be the, what the daily routine is it's the reading it's the writing it's the what I have created it's not some mythical um you know I, it, there, I don't think there's much glamour really being a writer <laughs> there really isn't I mean even with being a speaker like people think oh you just travel around the world and stuff but yeah you're in hotel rooms a lot you have to go to networking drink bad wine that type of thing <laughs> so I mean I think you have to love the job otherwise it's just another job I might as well just have stayed being an IT consultant but the point is like how much do you want this and what do you want your life to look like and how do you measure your success and for me as an introvert who just likes being alone a lot um, and making stuff up this is the best job in the world <laughs> and I, 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 as you're saying that I'm reminded I think it was Austin Cleon he said a lot of people want to be the noun without doing the verb yes and you have to want the verb you, you have, have to, want to, to be want... writing yeah yeah and and actually, uh, I think Elizabeth Gilbert did a very funny video. She did an interview with um, Marie Folio about exactly this same thing. And I'm not going to say, but because it, it involves some rude language, uh, the way she, she described it. If you look at that 
refall the Elizabeth Gilbert video if anyone's watching this just now and it, it talks exactly to this the, 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 the things that maybe the unpalatable things that you sometimes have to do because you love what you do so much and it's, it's, for, it's for a bigger a bigger calling um, I'd love to know uh, in the time we have left what tools do you use in terms of your your writing and and your obviously marketing and publishing getting things out into the world okay so Scrivener is the number one tool I would really struggle to write a book without Scrivener. Um, I'm sure you'll put a link in the show notes, but it's really cheap. It's like 50 US dollars. It is, uh, you can plan with it, you can write with it, you can even publish with it. It does export files, but I use Vellum, which is um, Mac only, but Vellum to, um, to publish. And I've got a tutorial on my website, so maybe you might link to that yep. tutorial. Um, but basically, Vellum allows me to create Kindle files, EPUB files for the other platforms, even print files. So really, with, with, with those two tools, you've really, you've gone a long way. And then the rest of them are, are very much online. So they are like Amazon KDP and Kobo Writing Life and their services. I mean, and these, just to be clear to people, these are free. It is free to publish. Um, so it, what costs you money is obviously working with an editor, uh, working with a cover designer, but even covers though, you can go with a site like Canva, C-A-N-V-A dot com, which I also use for blog posts and for social media things, but they do book covers as well for free. There are lots and lots of tools you can use like that. But yeah, the, the two I would say that are critical to my business would be Scrivener and Vellum at this point. And with Scrivener, I'm interested, when you come to starting to write, you're kind of outlining a book, because uh, I use Scrivener as well. And one of the things I've always tried to figure out is like when I'm, I can, I like to kind of think about who I'm writing, who I'm going to be writing it for, who the audience is, and put some just uh, an outline, a really like a structure, almost like a an internal proposal, book proposal, except I'm the only one that's going to be reading it at this stage. Is that something that you would do and you'd put into something like a Scrivener? So you've got some way of kind of looking back if you, if you get off, off, t off target a little bit you can pull yourself back and like why who is this for why am I writing and what's the goal for this book I'm probably not quite so I mean I would agree with that but for me it's more like I will create a Scrivener document when I'm thinking about a book um, for non-fiction I will just chuck in a whole load of one-liners mm -hmm. um, so I'll just put you know like for my how to write non-fiction I put things like book title um, as one chapter heading and then um, things like personal stories uh, quotes you know these were just one-liners and then what I do is then I fill in the blanks for non-fiction the brilliant thing about Scrivener is the ability to drag and drop and yeah. this is why it's far superior to Microsoft Word or anything you know just that you drag and drop you will never ever write non-fiction in order you can cannot I really truly believe that it would just never work so you're gonna have to drag and drop it around and reorganize and then for fiction I generally start with my research so there's um, in Scrivener there's a manuscript part and a research part so I will generally throw stuff in the research area and then I'll put my tentpole scenes um, which are the, you know the big scenes mm. I like I just wrote a scene in Alcatraz I knew I was gonna have a scene on Alcatraz so I you know had Alcatraz uh, scene and I knew I'd have one in, in Palma in Mallorca so I put that you know so um, and then again I kind of fill in the blanks but yeah the drag and drop um, writing out of order is just just critical. Now we're gonna have links to your books as, as we finish up here but I'd love to know if there was one book you would recommend to other people it could be on the craft of writing or, or the you know, the marketing side of things, what would that book be? The book I come back to over and over again is Turning Pro by Stephen Pressfield. Um, Steve's been on my show three times now and I just worship the guy. It's so funny whenever I interview him, I'm like, oh, hi, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he's he his work is very um has been a big impact on me a lot of people talk about the war of art but for me his book turning pro is the one i reread it probably every you know at least every year generally more regularly and i've got it on audio in print and in ebook wow. and you know it really is it and the point is and he it's hardcore it's like the amateur is this the pro does this um, and it's like, what do you want? And for me, I want to be a professional writer for the rest of my life. So what, what do, what can I emulate that will help me be a writer like Steve, for example, um, and to stand the test of time. So yeah, that would be my recommendation, Turning Pro by Stephen Pressfield. And a final question for you. Let's imagine you woke up tomorrow morning. I'm going to, I know you're a big, we're both big lovers of travel. So I'll let you choose wherever you want to wake up which city in the world, which place in the world you want to wake up to. But you have no books out. 
you have to restart again. But you do have all the skills that you've acquired over the years, um, although you don't have a platform. No one knows who you are. What would you do? How would you restart things? I, w- I would just start writing again. <laughs> I mean, I literally, I hope I would have a laptop. Um, but I, I would literally just start writing again. And I would write, uh, we did mention series a little bit. I would definitely start writing a series. Um, I would probably start with nonfiction because it is easier to make immediate money with nonfiction uh, because you can find a niche and, and write to it. Fiction takes a little longer to make money out of um, because, you know, you generally have to build up more of an audience. Um, but yeah, I would aim to probably write three books in a niche and use the first one to start the marketing, put that for free, do some promotion and start building it up that way. Um, what I would say is, you you know there's a lot a lot of people starting every day like don't feel you know if you're listening like you're like you'll never get anywhere because new people come along every day and break out every day and and I think what the amazing story for authors is if you ask people like who's your favorite author there often are only like less than 10 authors that people can name most authors are making a decent living and no one's ever heard of them so if you want to be a writer this truly is the best time in history to, to be one so yeah I would I would just get writing wonderful and uh, if people want to learn more about you um, and and all because uh, you have an incredible site uh, I absolutely love reading, reading your site and your, your blogs uh, so tell people where to go for that and tell us if people want to just read your work more generally and learn about your books where they should go yeah sure um, if you want you can find lots more at thecreativepen.com and also my podcast the creative pen podcast ah. with the double N <laughs> which is now almost at 400 episodes so, so lots of backlists for people to listen to for free. Lots of Stephen Pressfield. Good. Um, and uh, I'm on Twitter at the Creative Pen. If anyone has any questions. Well, Joanna, I, when I, I thought about putting this summit together, you were one of the very first people I, I really wanted to reach out to because you're such an authority. We use that word author. You are such an authority also on on writing and and publishing as well. So thank you so much for coming on today. I'm I'm looking forward to actually listening. I'm gonna after this, I'm gonna listen straight to that Stephen Pressfield one because I'm I'm a huge fan as well. But thank you so much for coming on and all the best with your future writing thanks so much for having me james if you're interested in living a more creative life then i'd love to invite you to join me as i share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use i put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me that's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity